Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, we are getting, we are nearing the end of Is Genesis History. I know you're happy about that. So I'm, I'm trying to go through this quickly so we can get through this and get on to something different because this has been dragging on. I'm sorry. We are uh, going to be reading this morning from uh, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verses 26 through 30. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. When's, the, when's that day? What, what is that a reference to when the Son of Man is revealed? You're all kind of right. It, the, the, this is kind of a broad statement about uh, the end times in general. Because when the rapture occurs, you won't have all the destruction. That follows within the, in the seven-year tribulation, um, and which leads to the um, Battle of Armageddon, which then leads to the Millennial Kingdom. So this statement here on the day when the Son of Man will, uh, is revealed, here's a case where day is not a specific 24-hour period, but by context we can tell that it's a, a much larger uh, time period, a, a general statement of, the, uh, of the, the end times or the day of the Lord. Why does Jesus go to the judgment of Noah's day as a point of comparison for the suddenness and extent of his return? Yeah, because uh, Luke uh, 17 is quoting Jesus. So as, as he's talking, I think to the Pharisees here, he, he gives them the statement that we just read, and he's talking about just as in the day of Noah, the, uh, the judgment is coming. So why does, he, why does he do that? He's talking to the Israelites, to the, to the leadership of Israel, and... Uh, He's using the, the, uh, the account of Noah as a, as a reference for them because it was something they should know. They did know because they knew their Old Testament, and so they knew what Moses had written in Genesis, and, and they knew of the, of the totality of the judgment. So what's Jesus hinting at when he, when he gives, this, gives them this, uh, this statement? that we just read in Luke 17, 26 to 30. Well, in Noah's day, they wiped out everybody but Noah's family and at the Battle of Armageddon, everybody's going to be not wiped out, but a judgment's going to be whether you're in the good line or the bad line. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I think the illustration is that there's the totality of the, of the Noahic flood and there's the totality of the judgment coming. No one escapes. That's the point. No one escapes. Yeah. Uh, there was a hint for Noah that the rain was coming, but it took him 100 years to, to build the ark. And so the hint was like uh, not real, um, not real uh, specific. Something's coming. We just don't know when. Well, we know that too. Something's coming, we just don't know when. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. And it's it's remarkable the the sinfulness of Noah's day. How it got to that point so close to the time, you know, we're we're talking we're not talking hundreds of thousands of years, we're talking just hundreds, excuse me, hundreds of years from Adam and Eve, maybe even a couple of thousand years until till the flood. And you have a, a totality of the of the nation of the of the planet being covered in, in sin and animals being affected by it, the, everything being affected by it. And that same thing then doesn't take too long after Noah until he's destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and you have, again, a, a swift demonstration of judgment. And I think that's the point Jesus is making. Um, as, you read, as we read the text, notice that there was a, a repetition. I'm, I'm, as we go through our various principal passages, I'm trying to teach you how to, how to look for those things. And one of the things that you see in the, in the text we just read is the repetition that Jesus uses and destroyed them all. Noah's flood and destroyed them all. Sodom and Gomorrah Noah's, or, uh, and destroyed them all. And so when you, when you see that, that becomes a, a hint to you that that's the important part. He talks about Noah and destroyed them all. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed them all. And so because it's repeated, it gives you the hint that, that Jesus is reminding us he destroyed them all. And that's coming. A judgment is coming. And uh, um, often we don't think of the events of the Old Testament as being being recorded for us to remind us of who God is and what he's done. You know, as we study as we study the scripture, what do we learn about God in each passage? What do we learn about his relationship to man in each passage? And here the relationship with God to man is man was evil and God was destroying him, was punishing him for his uh, evilness. Peter says that the means, that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. When he talks about the fire of judgment, he says, all these things are thus to be dissolved. What are the differences between these two types of global judgments? Kind of a difficult question. Yeah, that's, that's the obvious that uh, one's by fire and one's by, by flood. God said he's never going to flood the world again, but he didn't promise that he wasn't going to globally judge again. And the, the next global judgment that we have recorded for us will be at the, at the end. Yeah. He's going to recreate. He doesn't he doesn't it, he doesn't eliminate the material. He reorganizes the material. And in the reorganization of, of the new heaven and the new earth, sin will no, no longer be a potential. So he creates the first time, and he looks out each day and says it is good, and on the sixth day he says it is very good. It was exactly what he wanted for, for when he created it to accomplish his goal, and he puts man in the middle of it, and uh, man quickly messes it up, as he knew he would, and as he planned for him to do. And then throughout the course of history, until that, that time when he's ready to recreate, he, he reorganizes and recreates. It's not, it's not bara, it's not ex nihilo. It is a, a recreation of 
the stuff that was there, just like when we are resurrected, we're resurrected of our old material self into our new immortal self. Uh, he doesn't give us a, a new body. He redoes our old body. And he does that for the, for the universe as well. He creates a new universe, that, a new heaven and a new earth, that sin is no longer a potential. He will have, he will have proven his point. He will have dealt with, with sin and we will know all about as much as we can in our, in our uh, limited capacity, God, through what he did in world 1.0 and in world 2.0, sin no longer is a potential and it is the utopia of, uh, that is represented by the Garden of Eden. It, it's hard to say specifically when Peter's in uh, what he's re- referring to. Uh, it may just be the end of that that season when Satan is released, and the final judgment comes, and everything is recreated. And we don't have enough information in Daniel or Revelation or anywhere else in Scripture to give us a a true picture of what that's going to look like. We assume that there will be natural people that go from from tribulation into the millennium. We also assume there will be natural people that go from the millennium into that season. And then what happens at the end of that season, we have no information on. Does, Does everybody die in the season? And then God has judgment and sends them their different ways? Or are there natural people that survive through the season and God does something with them at the, at the end when he recreates heaven and earth? I, I don't know. There's just not enough information in Scripture. There, you know, we only have a couple of verses that talk about the new heaven and the new earth. You know, we've got a bunch about the millennium, a bunch about the tribulation. We've got just a couple that talk about the, that end. And so it's really hard to, to figure out what, what is going to happen. But total judgment will come and that judgment will ultimately lead to that new t- new heaven and new earth and and that's the point of of the passage that that Luke records quoting Jesus that judgment came swiftly on Sodom and Gomorrah it came swiftly on on uh, Noah's world and it will come swiftly again beginning with the rapture of the church and then we know the timeline from there. The only salvation from the coming global judgment is through the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 10. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment... If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. So Peter's making a a comparison um, between judgment that's coming and judgment that has come. Oh, I guess I should give the last verse. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. What is the comparison Peter is making in terms of how God will treat the godly versus the ungodly? And why is this a, an important distinction? Yeah. The the path forward for the ungodly 
is not a good one. I mean, it's pretty ugly. In reality, hellfire should be a real motivation to us to deal with our family and friends and neighbors and coworkers and so forth that don't know Jesus. Because their, their path is, is pretty ugly in the future. Whereas the path for the, for the righteous, those that have been redeemed, um, our path is, is pretty good. You know, as Paul said, for me to, to live as Christ and to die is gain. You know, I have, I have a positive future to look, at, to look for. We all do. But the ungodly do not. And, and that's kind of the, the point that Peter is making here. God, ju- God's justice requires that he punish sinners for their action. When God sent his son to die on the cross, Jesus, as the God-man, was the only one qualified as both a, a human who had to pay the price and as God who was sufficient to pay the price for all. He was the only one that, that qualified for that. And, and God made a sacrifice for him to do that. But in that sacrifice, God became legally justified in granting to us grace because the bill had been paid. And Jesus was the only one that could do that. And so God's justice requires payment. Jesus made the payment in a, in a legal manner. He was qualified to do that. Peter says that this justice applies equally to the angels, to those in Noah's day, to those in Sodom and Gomorrah, and those who living in the times of Peter uh, up to our own day. So we have, we have God's justice demanding action. Those that don't believe will, will get God's justice. Those that do believe will get God's grace and mercy. It's that simple. And unfortunately, we don't, we don't think of it that simple to tell our, our friends and neighbors and so forth that God's just and holy. He demands righteousness. Not that I have righteousness, because God sees me, and he sees me through the filter of Jesus' blood, which gives him righteousness. Um, and those that aren't in that filter don't get it. And I think that the picture of, of Noah and all of those people floating on the water afterwards, and all those dead bodies, I can't imagine what that looked like. I, I'm sorry? Or smelled like, yeah. There's probably a reason that there wasn't a, there wasn't a lot of, uh, of portholes on, uh, on the ark. That's why, that's why the fish didn't die. That's what I was just about to say. Maybe that's why God wants the fish left the fish to, to eat the, uh, the remains. To eat the remains. Could be. Why does it matter that God did not spare angels when they sinned? These are the angels. We believe that Peter is talking about the angels from, uh, from Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God, angels, um, cohabitated with the daughters of men, uh, women, and made the Nephilim race of people. Yeah. Yeah. No exception. Even for spiritual beings. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very true. Um, the angels are greater and more powerful than we are, and yet they they were judged exactly the same. In, in some ways, those particular angels, not all the angels that sinned with, with, uh, with Satan, or that fell with Satan, are judged that way, but these particular ones in Genesis chapter 6 have been locked up since then. The other angels that fell with Satan are around and causing us issues. We call them demons. But these particular ones, and we don't know the number, have been locked up since. 
And to me, that's an interesting, interesting thing. And, and as, as Peter describes it, they left their own, their own domain. They, they left their, their lane that they were supposed to be in, and they did something that was contrary to the order that God had directed. And um, God punished them specifically for that by not allowing them any kind of freedom at all. They got their, their justice immediately and remained there. Um, all this time. To me, that's an, that's an interesting deal that God elevated their sexual sin to a, and, and the fact that they left their domain to a higher level that demanded immediate justice. Aren't you glad that he doesn't do that for our sin? Immediate justice. That's right. None of us would be here. Answer. Right, right. Yeah, I I understand I understand what you're what you're saying, that we 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 don't know, but we don't have any indication in Scripture that there is any place. Um, any way for a, a fallen angel to become redeemed. We're all fallen as humans, but God provided us redemption. We have no indication in Scripture that God provided angels with a way of redemption. There's no indication that, God, that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was sufficient for angels as well. Would it have been? Why would it have been? God, Jesus was not an angel. He was human. And so he was qualified to pay a human sacrifice. But he's above the angels. But he's above the angels. He's a spiritual person above the angels. So why would his sacrifice not be sufficient for the angels? Well, if we use the, if we use the, legal, the, the, the righteousness and legality that God requires for, for man, it has to be of the same type Jesus had to be man in order to qualify to pay man's price. So if that's true for man, why isn't it true for angels? And, right. But, but God alone sacrificing was not sufficient because it was a man's penalty. And it required a man. Why would it for the angels if it doesn't for man? And they're not God either. No, no, you, you're, you're, you're misunderstanding the theology of it. Jesus had to be both God and man in order to pay the sacrifice for our sins. The only sufficient quality or quantity was the God portion. The only sufficient quality was the man portion. If that's true, that's a theological principle we understand from, from the text, that in order to pay man's spiritual price, the, the Savior had to be God-man. Right. So if that's true, then why is the same not true for angels that in order to pay the price for angel's sin, it would have had to have been a God-angel? I, I, because I, my opinion is we're restricting that definition on angels slash and God as to who exactly they are. That's what I mean by putting them in a the box. We're saying... God put himself in a box when he, when he said in order for man's sin to be paid for, man had to pay it. Okay. And so if that logic is true, why is an angel sin then require angels to pay it? Why on the converse of that could we not say it required a, if God is a heavenly being and it needed a deity or a, a, a heavenly being? No, that's not, what it's, that's not what I said. Not a heavenly being, God. I understand. And... and God required God and man to pay man's sin. Right. So that would require God 
and angel to pay angel sin. Right. I, I don't like that. Okay. I don't care. <laughs> I think that's way too restrictive as to we're, we're kind of saying here's what it has to be. Butch, if, if, if your point, if, if what you're saying were, were a valid point, then um, there would have to be a God dog for slippery when it has been. Hot dog! Man, just shut you down like right now. No, that's not. No, what he's saying is that. No, what, no, what I'm saying is what the scripture says. Well, you're, well, but what you're you just don't like what the scripture says. That's okay. Of the right. Well. Right. What, what you're saying is for each individual, there would have to, so there would have to be a God man for man to go. There'd have to be a God dog for dog to go. Right. There'd have to be a God. I think that's just. Well, God restricted himself when he, when he made it that way for, for man. Boy, I get real uncomfortable when I start talking about God restricted himself. I think we're getting back to it, and now we're almost back to what can God, you know, are there things God can't do? Yes. We know there's things there, yes, there are things God can't do. Right. We know there are things <laughs> that he can't or won't do because it's... No, can't do. Can't do, yes. What else can he do? What else can he do? Yeah. I didn't say that. I said we don't know. Okay, yeah, right. Go ahead, Chuck. You got us off the rails for sure. Right. I have. I'll have to look that up to make sure that there's nothing that gives us a hint that they can't. Because something's nagging in the back of my head that, that tells us that they can't, but I don't know if that's really scripture or, or what. But yeah, just, yeah, I, have to, I have to study that. There, there's, I'm sorry. It's, um, yeah, it's, like I said, I mean, is it possible that God has done it? Yeah. Right. Although he became man, which is lower than the angel, so he probably could, but we, we have no, like you said earlier, we have no information. Ann? Well, Scripture is for us to know right. about God. Right. So we don't necessarily have to know what God has in plan for the angels, right. except as they relate to us. Right. And, that, and that's why it's entirely possible that there is a way that we just don't know. But based on the theology of what God has said for man, Jesus doesn't qualify to be their propitiation. That's a word we'll have in, in uh, the message this morning. Um, he doesn't qualify for what we know from the text. That doesn't mean he doesn't some other way. But from what we know from the text, the theology of, of the, the soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, requires man and God to be one person to save us. Right, that's what I'm saying. And so if, if the theory holds, if God uses the same principle for man as he, uh, or for angels as he would for man, then, then it would be different. Okay. Okay. This whole conversation is an if. This whole conversation is an if. And, and you're not, you can't translate that into Swiffer going to heaven. Okay, go ahead. Knock yourself out. Just, just don't come crying to me when you get to heaven and Swiffer's not there. Because I will, in my non-sinful self, say, see, I told you so. 
And if Swiffer is there on the, on, the, on the heavenly leash with you, you can go, see, I told you so. Non-sinful self. Non that's, that's a stretch too, but... <laughs> the crows? Yes, because when they eat a lot of crows. Yeah. I, I will have I've eaten a lot of crow in my life, and a little salt and pepper and ketchup, it's okay. No, it doesn't. God, nothing tastes like chicken except chicken. God is always the one identified with saving Noah and Lot from judgment inflicted on those around them. How does Jesus save us from the wrath to come? We've kind of been talking about this. Yeah, by, by imputing to us his righteousness. He doesn't make us righteous. This is the part that so many people don't understand, and uh, uh, particularly that, that phrase that we had uh, as kids always about justified. Justified doesn't mean just as, just as if I'd never sinned. It doesn't mean that. You still have a history of sin. You still have a record of sin. And we will still sin. And we continue to sin until, until the rapture. Or until we're dead. I don't think we sin after we're dead. He sees us that way, but doesn't make us that way. The problem is, problem is that phrase, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. Does, you, you're not made just like you've never sinned. God sees you that way. You're still a sinner. You still have the ravages of sin in your body. We all take medication to care for the pain in our body that is a result of sin, etc., etc., etc. That's all still going to be true. After you've been saved, you don't automatically get new knees and, and new hips and new ears and full head of hair and so forth. Those are still the consequences of sin that are still going on in your body. Jesus... Jesus' blood now is the filter, and when God looks at you, he sees you through the blood of Jesus to see you as righteous. But it's not your righteousness, it's Jesus' righteousness that he, say, that he sees. Instead of rose colored glasses, he has sin colored glasses. Anti sin colored glasses, yes. Kind of like uh, an Instagram filter on your photograph. Yeah. You're still you, but you might look much yeah. different. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a big deal that, that we need to understand. You're not righteous yet. You're still sinning. You become righteous. It's a process that, that is, uh, um, as, as you go throughout life, you become more righteous. And ultimately, at the, at the rapture, you become totally righteous. But you still have the history of sin in your, in your life. The doctrine of judgment of God is one of the most important doctrines in the Bible, yet it also it is also one of the most ignored in modern churches. The reality of the global judgment of the flood is seen in the enormous layers of rock all over the earth. They should be constant remi uh, reminder to us that God judged the world in part, uh, or I'm sorry, in the past, and therefore will judge it again in the future. Peter himself points to our only hope of salvation. This Jesus is the same one that re was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no other, no one else, for there is no one, no, whew, wish I could read. For there is no one other, for there is no other name, hello, under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. The problem is you have these verses memorized in one version, and then you read them in another, it just messes you up. That was from Acts chapter 4, verse 11. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of uh, interesting scientific discoveries that have been going on in, uh, in recent years. In, uh, I've been reading of some missionaries in Congo, um, Cameroon and uh, Nigeria, that region of, the, of West Africa. Um, a, a mission team was, was there and, and they started getting contact with the Baca Indians deep into the, into the um, jungle, just like the, uh, 
the uh, Jim Hawking was with the I forget what they were called the same kinds of uh, way back into the woods never seeing a white guy and so forth as they began talking to them every little village had a story of a particular animal depending on the tribe they used a different name for it but when they when they showed them picture books of animals and including uh, what uh, dinosaurs look like they all picked the exact same animal a sour tops which is a which is a primarily uh, vegetarian large um, dinosaur not large like the like the giant ones but larger than an elephant larger than a uh, than a behemoth very very large and every one of them had stories of them by various names and when the missionary came home on deputation deputation uh, one uh, one year he he was giving the report in church and there was a uh, a christian biologist in in attendance and so he got very curious about this and began to do some investigation and eventually led a team to that part of africa and uh, they began to find to find physical evidence of these animals so far they have tracks that look like a typical lizard like type dinosaur only way bigger than any crocodile or uh, alligator or anything like that two two large rear feet and two smaller front feet um, and the size of the feet is is demonstrative of the fact that the animal is larger than the largest elephant they've ever seen and so they found physical evidence of that not not historic evidence but modern evidence and they continue this 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 search and there's a new team going uh, this uh, this fall to Africa to again explore further but the the evidence so far is is mounting that there are still at least in Africa um, dinosaurs of what kids grow up looking at dinosaurs what they look like and uh, the, the evidence is truly mounting and this is this is not a a Loch Ness or skunk ape search this uh, this has real evidence not fuzzy pictures kind of deal um, they don't they haven't yet none of the experts have yet found this but they have numbers of of people of the of the tribes that have face-to-face -face or live encounters with them and to me it's it's fascinating that all, all this time you know the the assumption has been that dinosaurs are extinct but there now is growing evidence that at least the sour tops is a is a real and ex continuing to exist um, dinosaur in Africa so when they can come up with pictures it'll make Jurassic Park seem kind of kind of really interesting I think yeah right the the jungle of that region of uh, of Africa is really thick but one of the biologists is is making the statement that he believes there are underground tunnels and caverns that these animals use to to get around um, so they're 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 subterranean uh, and and they they have found huge holes I mean a rabbit hole is you know is relatively small but if you've got a, a great big dinosaur you know we're talking about a big hole uh, and it's it's kind of interesting to me and uh, uh, it will do an awful lot to to change again the dynamic that that science is that modern anti-biblical science is going to have to adapt to now a, a live dinosaur in their presence when when they started being able to develop DNA from from fossils and bones for dinosaurs the whole you know the whole basis of Jurassic Park um, when they started to recover DNA they had to rethink how old dinosaurs were 
you know, they, they were teaching that dinosaurs were millions and billions of years old and had been extinct that long, but they, they've concluded that DNA only lasts a few thousand years when, in, in the right conditions. So if they're finding DNA, viable DNA, in bones and, and artifacts, it means that the dinosaurs were much more recent. And now to come face to face with a real live dinosaur uh, of that type, uh, it, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty dramatic s shift that, that science is going to have to uh, go through. And, and I think it just continues to reinforce the reality that we're six to 10,000 years old. Yeah. And are yeah, and the DNA is identical to ours. Yeah, Cro-Magnon has the same DNA as we do, which they can't argue. You know, they can't, they can't, they can't justify that other than it's a human. Okay, so it has a big brow. Well, I know guys that have big brows. Yeah. Yeah, it would have to. Yeah, it would have to. No other conclusion. No other conclusion. Right. 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 But don't think dinosaur as the as the 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 large dinosaur. But dinosaurs typically are reptilian, or often are reptilian, and lay eggs. So they could have. He could have taken two eggs. Uh, or he could have taken, remember, it's not by species that, that Noah took on the ark, it's by kind. And so whatever the, the master kind of dinosaur is, uh, that could be the, the situation. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, to, to say there are no dinosaurs today is to say that alligators and crocodiles aren't dinosaurs. They're exactly the description of dinosaurs. And dinosaur is a, is a recent word. It's less than 200 years old, and, and it, just, it just became the, the word du jour for, for creatures that have, have been extinct that we like to see as, as great big. But dinosaurs are of various kinds and sizes. But yes, it would have required Noah to have dinosaurs on the, on the, on the ark. Because, because uh, modern science doesn't look at, at crocodiles and alligators and lizards and stuff as dinosaurs. They restrict dinosaurs to, to just the T-Rex the and, and kind of, of critters. They do that because the fact that a, that a crocodile or a, a, an alligator is a dinosaur messes with their, with their, their um, evolutionary tree. You, you can't have something that is way past in the evolutionary cycle coexist with us today. That's, that's, why, that's why the scientific argument has always been that there's no place that dinosaurs and humans ever coexisted. Except every culture in the history has a fire-breathing dragon in its history. What's a fire-breathing dragon? Dinosaur that has bad breath. And every culture has that. Where did it come from? Probably from the reality that there was a fire-breathing dragon. Every culture has dragons. And we have, we have physical evidence of dinosaurs, uh, of the kind like T. rex and so forth, cohabitating with men. You know, we have, we have fossils in the same strata. So, Dino. Dino, there you go. I mean, Fred Flintstone wasn't wasn't eating regular hamburgers, right? <laughs> Dino back ribs. Father, thank you for the, the wonder of your, of your world that you created. We don't understand it. We can only uh, look at it in awe and look at how you've, you've taken care of things in and built things. We look forward to a time when 
when all of your creators, your creations are, uh, are on display for us and we can see them. We look forward to seeing the understanding and the viewing of things that have been hidden for so many years as you re slowly reveal to us who you are and, and what you've made in the world. Thank you for salvation given to us by the blood of Jesus Christ through your plan. Thank you for that. Give us a great time as we, as we worship you and as we fellowship together in the service to follow. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.